Thank you, Brother Jimmy and, uh, and Dr. Lance. How grateful I am for the privilege of being here with you in Alabama. Uh, I just can't tell you what a blessing and encouragement this is and how I've looked forward to this. Uh, you know, in these times of economic challenge, uh, Dr. Lance, if all of our Southern Baptist churches were as conscientious in stewardship as those of you from Alabama and uh, dedicated to the priority of giving to missions, I don't think we would have had to defer any missionaries from being sent to the field. In fact, when many are counting it good, that their decline in giving is not as bad as others, you are the state that is continuing to stay focused on God's priority of reaching a lost world and how grateful we are for your partnership and support through the cooperative program, the Light of Moon Christmas offering. I was thrilled just uh, hearing the reports from your, your colleges. You know, they didn't tell the full story, but I feel like your Baptist colleges are a franchise of the International Mission Board. I mean, there is just a constant flood of students going overseas, and we're grateful for that, uh, that perspective and faithfulness, and it's just good to be with you. This is in the midst of an extensive uh, travel circuit for me. Uh, this is the fourth state convention I've been in. Uh, Included five associational meetings, eight church mission conferences, a global mission week at New Orleans Seminary. In fact, with all of the travel, my wife and I decided, well, we just would do better to just drive. And so we've been on the road for about three weeks now, and we were making our way from one engagement to the other, driving several hundred miles for about the fourth day in the, in the, in, in the row. And I said, well, you know, when we retire, uh, this is what we'll get to do. She said, I don't think so. <laughs> That's not her idea of, of retirement. But, you know, I, I've always wanted to maximize the opportunity to, to challenge Southern Baptists to cast the vision for what God is doing around the world. And, and I used to even be so foolish as to book an engagement in one state on Sunday morning and another state on Sunday night believing that the airlines uh, could be depended on to get me there. Well, I've uh, since discovered that uh, you can't count on that efficiency. In fact, I was speaking in uh, Florida on a Sunday morning and scheduled for a big mission rally in Missouri on Sunday night. Plenty of margin to get to the airport, plenty of time to get there after the flight arrived. But when I checked in, there was that sign on the board, flight canceled. And I just panicked, you know, this is not good. You know, I have got to get there. The agent said, well, it's no problem. We've got you backed up on the next flight. You'll get there at 9 p.m. I had a suit and tie on and a Bible in my hand, unlike most people traveling on the airlines these days. It was obvious I was a preacher. I, I said, but listen, I'm speaking at 6 o'clock, and this just isn't a church. It's a big rally with flags and choirs and missionaries, you know, and I, I was just panicked. You've got to find some way to get me there. She said, well, let me see if there's an alternate flight. She began to type on the computer. And as she was, she was uh, doing that, she said, uh, you know, I've been taking this course at my church uh, by somebody by the name of Blackaby um, that said a crisis is an opportunity for God to work in your life. <laughs> and I stood there and thought, that's my line, <laughs> you know. I'm supposed to be saying that, but I share that just to say we all know a crisis is an opportunity for God to work in a unique way in, in our own lives personally, but also in our world today. And in the midst of warfare and chaos, uh, political disruption, economic uncertainty, natural disasters, God is using global events and the crisis and chaos of our world to turn the hearts of people to a search for something that will give them hope and security that can be found in Jesus Christ. And that's not just true around the world. It's in our country today, in your neighborhoods and communities, the economic crisis 
the, uh, the oppression and depression, the pace of life is creating a need for something that people will find only in Jesus Christ if we will share it with them. I was traveling a couple of years ago in Central uh, Asia, an area of the world where I'm still intrigued that we, we even have missionary personnel witnessing and planning churches and uh, those Islamic countries that were so long a part of the Soviet Union and deprived of, of uh, religious freedom, prohibited from hearing the gospel. And as we would go to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, and those republics, it, it was thrilling to see churches being planted, people who for generations were just in, in bondage to darkness and spiritually destitute were just responding to the hope that they were hearing in the gospel and that Christian witness was multiplying. It was the end of my trip and I was prepared to return home the next day and I asked our regional leader how many of the people groups here in Central Asia have now been evangelized in terms of certainly not all one to the Lord but in terms of uh, churches being planted and, and multiplying a Christian witness in that language. He knew instantly. He said, so far we reached 23 of the people groups here in Central Asia. And my heart just burst with pride that we were seizing that opportunity to go to the edge and penetrate that frontier of lostness with the gospel. Then I asked the wrong question. Knowing they were doing demographic research to stay on the cutting edge of our mission task, I ask, well, how many people groups here in Central Asia have yet to be engaged with a Christian witness, with the gospel? He didn't immediately respond. In fact, he lowered his head, and I thought he was thinking, calculating a response to my question. But when he looked up, tears had filled his eyes. His voice was touched with emotion. He said, Jerry, we can identify over 300 people groups here in Central Asia, as best we can determine, have not yet even heard the name of Jesus. Now that's hard for us to comprehend in this age of technology and communication when we can see news events as they occur simultaneously all over the world, that there are people isolated culturally and geographically that have not even heard the name of Jesus. But I'll never forget his next statement. He said, you know the most difficult thing about being uh, administrator, leader of our International Mission Board, our Southern Baptist work here in Central Asia, is every year in our annual planning, looking at the limited personnel and resources and having to determine which of these people groups will be deprived of hearing the gospel yet another year. And I came back with the question burning in my heart, by what criteria should any people around the world be deprived of hearing the gospel? When God has blessed us in numbers and resources, the potential in our lives and churches of taking the gospel literally to the ends of the earth. But let's bring that question back home. With the number of churches and Baptists and Christians in Alabama, by what criteria should any person be deprived of hearing the life-saving, transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I want to focus your attention today on one little verse of Scripture in 1 John 3, 17. It's a verse I wish... God had not included, inspired in his holy word because it, it pierces my heart with conviction every time I read it. But 1 John 3, 17 says, Whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But you know, if there's any verse of Scripture, a good Southern Baptist knows, I guess next to John 3.16, of course, would be the Great Commission. 
In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, where our Lord Jesus tells us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We clearly understand our mission task. We understand the urgency of telling people about Jesus, making disciples, bringing them into the kingdom. We know the consequences of lostness for someone to be apart from Christ. But too many times we treat the Great Commission as if it was just an afterthought. Having come to the end of his ministry with all of the wealth of teachings we find in the Gospels, having been baptized and risen again and now ready to ascend to the Father, it was as if Jesus had gathered with his disciples on that hillside in Galilee and thought, by the way, it just occurred to me, why don't you go and disciple other nations? No, it, it wasn't an afterthought. It was the heart of his mission. It was born in the heart of God before the foundation of the world. It was why he called Abraham to leave his home and family. Through his seed, all the families of nations would be blessed. It's why he called Israel to be his chosen people, not just to curry God's favor and to receive his grace, but they were to be a missions people to tell of his glory among the nations, to declare his salvation to the ends of the earth that all the people's would praise his name it wasn't an afterthought but so many times we treat it as if it's peripheral do everything that God expects of us in developing Christian character and discipling and living a Christian life and fulfilling all the programs of our church and oh yeah we're supposed to witness to the lost and even do missions beyond where we live and it's not a matter of understanding our mission. We're, we're very clear in that regard. But it's a matter of motivation for personal involvement in that mission. And I think Jesus understood that that would be the problem, even with his disciples. Because you find throughout his ministry and his relationship with them, I think actually preparing them to be motivated for that mission that he would then relegate to them as the priority of their task in being the people of God. For you see, the first command that Jesus gave to his disciples after, of course, the command to follow me was not the command to witness, to make disciples, to, to, to go to the nations. The first command that you read Jesus giving his disciples was the command to look, to look. Early in his ministry, his conversation with the woman at the well there in the fourth chapter of John, you remember the disciples had been to the city to buy food. They returned and Jesus said to them in verse 35, say not there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already unto harvest. And I would like to suggest that before we presume to fulfill God's plan for sharing, we need God's perspective of seeing. We need to open our eyes, look beyond our attendance on Sunday morning, our church programs, look beyond the fulfilling gratification of our mission trips and projects and see the lost world around us. The world as God sees it. In that trip to Central Asia, I was in conversation with one of our, our, our personnel who was teaching at a technical school in Nakus, a little, little city in northwest Uzbekistan among the Karl Kapak people. And uh, he was telling me that the school has a school song, the words of which go something to the effect, the name of the school is the center of Nakus. Nakus is the center of Karl Kapak land. 
called Kapak land is the center of Uzbekistan, and Uzbekistan is the center of the world. Now, it's, it's probably never occurred to you here in Alabama that Uzbekistan is the center of the world. Geographically, it probably is, but, uh, but it's not our world. Our world centers around ourselves, our interest, our community, our concerns. But we'll never reach a lost world until we're willing to open our eyes and see beyond our self-centered provincialism to see a world that is lost as God sees it, a world that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at the people in your own city and community yet to be touched by the gospel. You'll never fulfill God's mission and plan for sharing until you're willing to look at them and see them and acknowledge them and their need to come to God. But notice Jesus said to his disciples, look at the fields that are white under harvest. You see, God is moving in our world today. We need to realize that, that, that God is using global events and circumstances, the problems of life, to open hearts to a spiritual answer. We're, we, it, it, it's, a, it's amazing in, in what we see God doing today. I, I used to tell people that the last decade of the 20th century saw the greatest advance in global evangelization than in all 200 years of modern missions since William Carey went to India. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, thousands of volunteers, missionaries sweeping into uh, the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, and you're going to hear that from Shannon Ford and your partnership with the Ukraine and the opportunity that God is giving us there, our discovering creative access strategies to engage uh, closed doors, countries hostile to a Christian witness, uh, we saw a tremendous advance. But it pales in comparison to what we are seeing God do as we move into the 21st century. The first five years of, of the 21st century, our missionaries reported an average of 1,000 new believers a day being baptized around the world. If you're not into math, that's 365,000 a year. Last year, our missionaries reported over 600,000 new believers baptized. We had just set a record in 1999 of 4,000 new churches started. Last year, we reported over 24,000 new churches started. But more significant than that, each year for the last eight years, more than 100 unreached people groups have been engaged with the gospel for the first time. God is opening doors of opportunity that we would have never imagined and he will say, open your eyes, lift up your eyes, look beyond the headlines and the newscast. See a world in which God is at work, a world in need of reaping and harvest the gospel. But even after Jesus commanded his disciples to look, he still didn't command them to witness, to go, make disciples. In fact, the next command you, you read Jesus giving to his, his disciples, his followers, was the command to love. On over in the 13th chapter of John, as he was gathered with them in the upper room, uh, you remember he said to them in verse uh, 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. A short time later, a young Pharisee asked him the question, which is the greatest command? What an opportunity to say, go into all the world, make disciples. No. He said the greatest command, quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And then he hastened to say, the second is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and just to make sure there was no misunderstanding he told the story of the Good Samaritan to make it clear that neighbor we're to love are not people like us that we gather with every Sunday and fellowship with in our subdivision and housing 
complex. No, it's people of different races, cultures, even antagonistic relationships, people that don't necessarily like us. And I would like to say that not only is GPS must be predicated on God's perspective of seeing, but God's program of sowing. For you see, the sowing must be done in love. A world must see what motivates us to share a gospel witness. It's not just impersonally passing out a track or hanging a, a flyer on a doorknob but it's pouring your lives into others, showing the love of God. Jesus said, by this, all men shall know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. You see, that, that's God's program of sowing the gospel out of a, a motivation of love. Why? Because love is other-centered. You know, it's not about us. You love your family. You love your children. You give yourselves to them. Love makes possible the phenomenon of sacrifice. It's not self-centered. We're willing to, to, to give, to sacrifice for the sake of beloved. Well, what about a lost world? Do we think we'll implement God's plan of sharing just so our denomination can report more baptisms so we can have statistical growth or maybe improved attendance at our church. No, the only motivation is a love for people. A love that comes from God. It, 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 that's not our nature. And that's why Jesus said you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul. When you come to the place of recognizing we're just a sinner saved by grace, undeserving of his mercy, there's something that elicits a love for God and what he's done for us that enables our lives to become a channel of his love to others, motivating us, compelling us for involvement in God's plan of sharing. I used to think beating people over the head with the Great Commission would result in more people surrendering to missions, churches giving more generously, praying more, witnessing to the lost in their neighborhood. It doesn't. It doesn't motivate us. You would think any Christian would be conscientious about doing what our Lord commanded us to do but we just rationalize that it applies to our pastor and church staff. That's their responsibility or the missionaries we send on our behalf. In a recent appointment service, uh, after the missionaries had given their testimonies, uh, the crowd just erupted in a spontaneous ov ovation that just went on and on. And afterward, the pastor leading the prayer of dedication addressed our missionaries and said, you know why everyone was clapping so enthusiastically? because it's you going and not them. Yeah, we know the need for people to go, and we delight in sending out missionaries and those that are witness, but why aren't we motivated to share the experience that we've had? It's not until we're willing to see the lost around us as God sees them and love them with the love that God gives in our hearts to motivate it for them reading a book on Dr. by Dr. J. Conant on evangelism, I ran across a statement that helped me understand that concept. He said, the Great Commission is sufficient authority to send us after the lost, but it's not sufficient motivation. And he goes on to say, well, it's not the authority of an external command even of our Lord. I mean, we know what our Lord's told us to do. That doesn't result in our necessarily living it, doing it, being obedient to it. It's not the authority of an external command, but the impulse of an indwelling presence that sends us after the lost. If we're going to be successful in God's plan of sharing, in your town and community and state and around the world, it's going to come only when we have God's perspective of seeing and God's program of sowing in love. Not because we're commanded to, 
not because it's what we ought to do and need to do in fact I have to kind of swallow hard to acknowledge this God never commanded anyone to go to the nations and a lost world you know if you're familiar with the grammar of that great commission passage in Matthew 28 you know there's only one active transitive imperative verb it's make disciples that's what we're commanded to do not not because we we have to but Jesus taught his disciples a a new lifestyle transformed by God's Holy Spirit it wasn't a, a, that narrow ritualistic Jewish legal system that's not why we do evangelism and why we witness because we're told to we have to that's what the law commands us to do no it's out of a, a lifestyle of seeing a lost people and loving them and identifying with them how do you make disciples the rest of the verb forms are participles by baptizing them from profession of faith teaching them all that Jesus commanded well how do you make disciples of the nations well, let me just bring that home are all the peoples in your community all of those immigrant nations peoples language groups races cultures by going identifying with them relating to them not because we're commanded to what Jesus literally said is as you are going make disciples of all peoples we don't do evangelism we don't fulfill God's plan of sharing out of an obligation because it's a program that's what we've commanded to do when we see a lost world and we love that world it's an expectation we will reach out in God's plan of sharing because it's predicated on God's perspective of seeing and God's program of sowing in love now in conclusion come back to that little verse with me in 1 John 3 17 where Jesus said if whoever has this world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes our heart against him how does the love of God abide in him closes with a question but actually this verse confronts us with four questions the first question is what do you have do you have this world's goods now, you might readily respond not as much as I had a year ago when the economy took a nosedive but, uh, but let's be honest God has blessed us with this world's goods God has blessed and prospered us as Americans. I doubt if there's anyone here that has to be a concerned about a roof over your head, a bed to sleep in, clothes to wear, food to eat, like many of the peoples of our world. Because God's blessed us with the material needs and comforts of this world. But you know the greatest good you can have in this world is your salvation knowing Jesus Christ there is no material blessing or benefit that's greater than knowing Jesus Christ now is that not what we have what God has given to us in this world in this life well the second question then is what do you see do you see your brother in need now you're probably like me I immediately think of the homeless in the inner city those less fortunate than we are certainly God wants us to minister to them and reach out and minister to their needs but what greater need does our brother in humanity have than the need for Jesus to be lost do you see them do you, do you see the lost in Darfur and Sudan those in hopelessness and despair in war-torn countries like Afghanistan and Iraq do you see the more than 1 billion people locked into unreached people groups hopeless spiritual darkness do you see the lost in your community your brother that's not your blood relative but that's your brother 
may be Hispanic and Vietnamese and African American. They're your brother. They're that Samaritan that we're to love. Are you willing to see them, acknowledge them, in their need for Jesus? Well, the third question then is implied. So what do you give? Or how do you respond? What, what do you do about it? Or, as the scripture implies, do you close your heart against sin? Some translations say your heart of compassion. Now go back to God's program of sowing, to love. This is the testimony of genuine discipleship that will draw people to Christ. But if you close your heart of love and compassion, rather than reaching out to provide what they need, is that the response? I remember receiving a letter from a gentleman, I think somewhere in Texas a few years ago, who had a prayer ministry and said, Dr. Rankin, I pray for you and the International Mission Board. I pray for your missionaries uh, systematically and and I try to keep up with what the needs are around the world. And he said, I've been reading all the publicity about the unreached people groups and those that are yet to be engaged with the gospel witness and the need for more missionaries, the need for more churches to become engaged in partnership with the, with the IMB. And he said, I've been praying, Matthew 9, 38, where the scripture tells us, Jesus said to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into the harvest. Then he asked me, why isn't God answering my prayer? Why isn't he doing what he promised to do? Why isn't he sending out the laborers that are needed to reach the lost, the unreached people? I didn't know how to respond. I'd been wondering the same thing myself. But after praying and meditating on it, I I remember writing him and I said, Sir, I believe God is answering your prayer. He is calling out his people and the laborers into the fields of harvest. But the laborers are not responding because of a closed mind or a calloused heart or a reluctant will. Now I make this application to the need for people to go all over the world. Why have we not recognized the potential in our life, in our church, to touch a lost world and peoples and tell them about Jesus why are we not reaching out to the lost in Alabama and where we live have we allowed our minds to be closed to the possibility that I can do that I have a witness to share God's given me something that others need have we been convinced by the enemy that we're not qualified there's nothing we can do Let somebody else do it. Or could it be that we've allowed our hearts to become calloused and indifferent? Like the crowd applauding for missionaries who were going, thankful that that's not us that has to go. God hasn't called me. We just celebrate what others are doing. But have allowed our hearts to be hardened and indifferent and calloused to the needs of a lost world, bemoaning the fact that our culture is in a moral decay and away from God, but just indifferent because our salvation is secure? Or could it be just a reluctant will that's unwilling to lay our lives on the altar and in submission to the Lordship of God, willingness for Him to lead us and use us wherever He sends us, whatever He wants us to do in God's plan of sharing. What do you have to share? What do you see? What do you give? What do you share? For you see, they're all answered by the fourth question. How much do you love? For how can you say 
the love of God is in you. And close your heart to the lost about us. May God bless you as you gain, as you participate in GPS, God's perspective of seeing a lost world. As you allow God to motivate you through his program of sowing and then are faithful in his plan of sharing your witness with the lost.